Hey, fellowship, family, and friends, good morning to everybody, whether you're on YouTube or you're Facebook in it or you're on our website. I just want you to know wherever you're watching right now, welcome into the fellowship. What an amazing worship experience we have every single week. I love our team, both creative team and the worship team. They're awesome. Give them some hand claps, throw up some loves and likes, and, uh, and let's get after it today. Now, I know I've been saying this through the entire quarantine, and you're going to hear me say it again. I just want to remind all of us that from the Fellowship family right here in Central Florida, Lake County, we have not shut down one single weekend. We have remained open the whole time, and we are going to continue to do that because we believe that the Word needs to continue going forward and being a part of our connection to you. So I'm going to begin a, a brand new collection of talks today. And it's going to be on the life of somebody that was a worldwide crisis leader. I mean, he led the world through a crisis. He's an Old Testament character in the Word of God named Joseph. And today, being Father's Day, I couldn't miss the opportunity to just say, Dad, man, we love you. We thank God for you. And just so you know, Dad, your kids, they love you too. And they look up to you. They think you're awesome. And we have a special little tribute for you. Check it out. There it is. Stay groovy, Dad. Stay groovy, man. Hey, grab your Bible, your Bible app, and you can follow along right on the screen. We'll have the verses up for you, and there's notes in the app as well. So we want to encourage you to take notes. You can clip and paste. You can write them, whatever's best for you. But let's get started in our weekly Bible study together. So let me pray for us as we get cranking up. Father, we come to you right now. Uh, I'm on this end of the screen and a lot of folks on the other side of that screen that we're asking, would you settle our mind and our hearts, remove any distractions, and allow us to learn from your word today. We want to honor you with the teaching of your word, and we want it to make application into our lives to be better for it and to serve in a greater way in your kingdom. So God, thank you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me get started with a question for you. You ever met somebody, wherever it was in your journey of life, that had the it factor? I mean, they just, they had swag, man. For me, I, when I was thinking about this question and getting ready to start this collection of talks, I thought about a friend. Uh, when I was in high school, I was a freshman. He was a senior. He was the starting quarterback. Man, you'd see him walking down the hallways of our high school, and everybody wanted to be around Jeff. Man, he just was cool. He had swag. He wore all the right clothes. He had the right hairstyle. He drove the right car. And man, I just looked at him and thought, oh, if I could just be a little bit more like him. I want to remind you, dads, right now, that's you to your kids. Man, you got swag. Now, you may go, oh, they think I'm corny or they think I'm silly or old-fashioned. I'm telling you, dad, you're the greatest influence in their life right now, you and that mom. So, you got swag in their life. You need to leverage that for God's glory. But there's somebody else we're going to look at. I've already told you, Joseph. And he had swag, man. He had 
the it factor. His life started out with such great promise and potential, only to find some personal pain. He began to go through crisis as well as the world began to go through a crisis, and it seemed like it would never end. It was like his life was trending in the wrong direction. And it wasn't just one bad thing that happened to him, man. It was a series of unfortunate events that happened to him. Kind of like if you remember last September, we had Hurricane Hugo. It, it, when it got over Puerto Rico, it was like it just parked there and dumped water and, and flooded it and caused so much damage and lots of life and storms and winds. That's Joseph's life. It's like the hurricane landed over his life and just didn't let up for a while. This was a guy that was betrayed. He was beaten by his own family. He was abandoned by his own family. He was human trafficked, man. I mean, it is sad to see some of the things that happened. And just when it looked like things might get a little bit better for him, you know what happened? Another storm came. He's accused of trying to sexually assault his boss's wife. And he goes to prison. And the people he had already helped, they forgot all about him. But his story didn't end there, and that's what we're going to look at. So Joseph didn't see any of this coming, though. And you might say, well, why would this happen to somebody that had the it factor, somebody that God had already said, I want to bless you? Well, we're going to look at because there's 12 chapters in the very first book of the Bible called Genesis, 12 chapters devoted to Joseph's story. And I can just tell you, here's how much swag this guy's got. There's more ink, more press time for Joseph and telling his story than Adam, the first man ever created, than Abraham, than Jacob, than Isaac. I mean, this guy is the real deal. And I just want you to know, the Word of God talks favorably on him. But he has to go through some difficult times. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So if I could kind of summarize everything about his life, here it would be. And don't tune me off after I say this. Hang with me so that I can uh, break this out for you. But it's divine purpose. Man, he had God's divine purpose on his life. And here's what I know. I believe God's got a divine purpose for your life as well. So that's why we want to dive into this. So when it's all said and done, here's what I know about Joseph's life, because I'm able to look at it in retrospect, that he's going to emerge as one of the greatest heroes of all time, in the Bible specifically, but of all time. And there are very few leaders who finish their life well, but Joseph, even in the midst of dismal odds and incredible pressure, he finishes well. So when Joseph was hated, I can just tell you, he never retaliated. When he got tempted, like all of us do, he didn't give in to the temptation. When it seemed like life was falling apart, man, he stayed with it. He got through the crisis. So Joseph's going to be our guide. We're going to start right into chapter 37 where we pick up his story. And it begins in chapter 37 of Genesis, starting in verse number 2. Here it is. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old. Hey, folks, 17 years old. He's a teenager. Pretty cool. He often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Now, let's press pause right there. Did you notice right away in Joseph's family, uh, they are anything but perfect. They are far from it. In fact, I think that would be even putting it nicely. There's a lot of dysfunction going on. You know what? I think there's always a little dysfunction in everybody's family, my family, your family. We all have a cousin Eddie in the family. We've all got that odd uncle or aunt in the family. So so does Joseph, and that's part of his journey. And Joseph's dad, I can tell you, Jacob is his dad. He, too, was far from perfect. And as a result of the imperfection, which we all have, Now, their family's broken in a number of different ways. And Joseph, although a gifted, talented, called by God man, he was not perfect. And it says right here in the Word of God that he told on his brothers. In other words, he was a tattletale, verse number two said. I don't know about you. Maybe you've had a tattletale uh, person in your family. When I was a kid, I was the baby of four. I had an older brother and two older sisters, and I can tell you, There were many times I had information that I felt my mom and dad needed to know, and you probably would call me a tattletale because they certainly did more than on one occasion. So a tattletale 
is a spirit in somebody that has this sense of self-righteousness. And that's what we see in Joseph when he begins to tell on his brother. So he's going to dad saying all this stuff about the boys. And I can tell you it's far more than just immature. This is a revealing part of his character at a very early age. It shows like a hairline fracture in his character. And pride can show up in a lot of different ways in all of our lives. And it doesn't matter how gifted you are, how talented you are, how good-looking, how wealthy you might be. Pride will take us down every single time. So, now to make some matters worse in Joseph's life, here's what happened. His father begins to feed this pride problem. Look at verse, verse number three. Jacob loved Joseph. Do you get it? Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, and it was a beautiful robe. Now, um, I was in a play years and years ago, and this was my Joseph robe, the coat of many colors. There it is. Just serves as a reminder. So you probably know the story a little bit about Joseph's coat, and we're going to look at that later in this series. But his brothers, according to verse number four, they hated him. They hated him because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. Man, can you feel the tension growing? I can tell you as a dad, I have three children. They're all grown now. Two have already graduated college, one in college. And I can just say that if I started buying gifts for one of my three children, and I began saying, you know, at every family gathering, hey, I got a gift for, and you name one of my three, and I start giving them gifts and saying things like, man, I love you so much, and I love you more than the other two. You would look at me and go, no, that's not very smart, David. Well, that's what Jacob, Joseph's father, does. He demonstrates that, Joseph, you're my favorite. Out of all the kids, 13 of them, you're my favorite. And the mistake that Jacob made was that he let the other kids know. He wanted to drive this deep into them as well. Now, how do you think Joseph responds to this? How do you think he feels about getting the Gucci coat from dad? Well, his pride begins to swell. So I want you to see that it might have been Jacob's fault, but it also went straight to Joseph's head, and he began to flaunt it. So both guys, there's some dysfunction going on. And in addition to being self-righteous and telling on his brothers and having this pride, I think we also can say uh, unequivocally, these weren't wise moves to make, so maybe there was a lack of discernment and wisdom. Look at uh, chapter 37 and verse number 5. One night Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about the dream about it. They hated him even more than ever. Man, not only did they already hate him for being a tattletale, now they hate him even more because he's telling them about their dreams. Now, I don't know about you. I think all of us have different dreams. Sometimes they make sense. Sometimes they don't. I can tell you there are times I wake up and go, man, I had the weirdest dream last night. You probably have had those too, just weird dreams. So I really like Joseph's story because we get a little bit of an insight to when he's resting and he begins to dream and God plants things in his dreams, we get to see those things come to life. In fact, there were two very specific dreams that Joseph had. One had to do with agriculture. One had to do with astronomy. But in the gist of the dreams, here's what happened. Joseph was telling them, because he saw it in his dream, that he was in a position of supremacy over everybody else in the family. And these dreams are actually a part of God ushering in this promise that he gave to Joseph earlier on in his life, that God was going to use him in a very influential way. And so much of the family is going to depend on Joseph in the future and on his leadership. And I can tell you, man, when he began to share these dreams with the brothers, whew, they did not like him. Scripture says they hated him. And God is telling Joseph, hey, man, at a very early age, i got big plans for your life, and God is going to use Joseph in a profound way. But if Joseph doesn't root out some of this pride, and by the way, all of us have a, a little bit of pride in us, and we don't get that junk out of our heart, it ruins God's plans for our life. So God, here's the way God works. And we see it in Joseph's life because jo God loved Joseph so much, God began to uproot some of that pride. God began to chisel away at it. And I can tell you, 
that when that happens in your life and in my life, it becomes uncomfortable, sometimes even painful. And we start to see that at the end of chapter 37, starting in verse number 18, when Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they began to scheme and make plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell Dad, hey, a wild animal's eating him. And we'll see what becomes of his dreams then. So, yeah, Joseph, you got some cool dreams? Let me tell you how those dreams are going to play out if you're not here with us anymore. Now, I know you've heard me say this before if you've been tracking with us any length of time, but I'm going to say it again if you missed it. Over and over again, God loves you just as you are. Man, he loves you. In spite of you, in spite of the dysfunction, God loves you. And I can say that the love that God has for you right now, it has been there all along, and it is stronger now and far greater now, no matter where you are in this season of life. And you see, in the middle of the uncertainty that we're all going through right now and we're experiencing in this time, the one thing that is certain about the only way that this crisis might get worse is if that we don't come out of it, we don't emerge out of this crisis being changed, becoming more like Jesus. So when we come out, we need to be able to lift out of this in a powerful, good way. That's what happens in crisis. We should emerge from crisis and come out of it, not just go back to the way things were, not just become the person we used to be, But this time can be a time where we have our character developed, a time that we begin to be more like Jesus. Now, listen, I know that right now all of us long for a sense of normalcy. And I can just say this to you. I think you'll let me have the liberty here to say, um, what is normal anyway? Because when I read Scripture, God certainly doesn't have a normal in Scripture. Man, he deals all through the corridor of time in different ways in different means in people's lives. In fact, I don't believe that God even wants you to live a normal life. He never has. I believe that God wants you to go above and beyond what the rest of this world sees as normal. He wants far more for your life. And I know that because the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said in the third chapter of the letter to the church in Ephesus, he said in verse number 20, Now, all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work that is within you to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So friends, I want you to hold on to that promise from Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 20. God wants to do infinitely more in your life, so much so that you don't even know how to ask for it. And maybe that's what he's doing right now in this time of crisis that we've all been going through for many, many weeks right now. It is kind of like Joseph's life. Joseph went through a crisis. We're going through a crisis. But I want you to know, man, why would God allow so many horrible things to happen in Joseph's life just for the sake of Joseph having to go through the pain and discomfort? No, man. He wanted to build something in Joseph, and I believe that's what he's doing in us. And one of the characteristics that I know to be consistent with God's character all through the Word of God is that he shapes people into being more like him. And that's what he's doing with Joseph. He wants Joseph to be great, infinitely great. And that's what he said of you as well. And for Joseph, cleaning out the pride so that his character could grow and mature is what God is doing. And so God wants that of all of us. He wants us, even if we have to go through a little bit of pain, even if we have to go through some discomfort, he wants us to look, talk, act more like Jesus. Because really, this is the ultimate goal. And sometimes we'll think, oh, we're Americans, the ultimate goal is achieving the American dream. No, it really isn't. The goal is to become more like Jesus. And I can tell you, that's the purpose for your life. If you've ever gone, you know, Pastor, how do I discover what my purpose in life is? Well, here's what I'll tell you. In a simple way, you become more like Jesus, and you'll begin to discover what your purpose is. So God might be chiseling away at you right now. He's going to chip some things away from your life so that you become more like Jesus. And that's what we see happening in Joseph's life. And although it might be painful, although it could be uncomfortable at times, I can tell you it's in the midst of the pain and discomfort that God gives us a promise. He promises us this, and I I, I love this. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. 
Matter of fact, in Joseph's life, listen to what Scripture says in the 39th chapter of Genesis, verse number 1. When Joseph was taken to Egypt, so now he's left what was normal, the life with his family, thrown into a pit, sold, human trafficked into slavery. Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders. He was purchased by Potiphar, a critical name for you to know in this story. Potiphar was an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So we know you got the king of Egypt, you got the captain of the guards here, but the Lord was with Joseph. Man, say that one right now, wherever you are, the Lord was with Joseph. Actually, I want you to change that a little bit and say, the Lord is with me. Not David, don't say my name, the Lord is with me. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of the Egyptian master. So the Lord was with Joseph. So Joseph here, although he's been beaten up by his brothers, he's been abandoned. He's been sold into slavery. He's living in a foreign land he knows nothing about. His circumstances seem uncomfortable. It looks like a total life crisis. But it says something critical here that I know you caught, and I've already said it, and I'm going to say it again. God was with him. And as a result of God being with him, man, he began to prosper. He began to succeed. And he began to establish what's called a new normal. Man, that's what God wants to do, I believe, in us. Begin to establish a new normal in us as a result of what we've been going through for the last several months. Through it all, God was with him and God is with you. And those might be some of the most important words that you're going to hear today. Maybe this whole week or this month or through this whole pandemic, God's with you. And this week, I want to continue on this walk in Joseph's life, but before I leave you today, I want to make three quick observations that you can make some application in your life from what we've read just in the short portion. We're going to dive in deep next week. But just from the short portion of Joseph's life to start us today, here's application number one. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Do you know that? Man, I hope you do. He has a plan and a purpose. No matter what age you are right now, he's got a plan and a purpose for your life. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11, God says this to you and I, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good, not for a disaster, to give you a future and a hope. So we've got the advantage today of looking in the rearview mirror at Joseph's life. We can see the whole story unpacked for us. But man, Joseph couldn't see it. He was in the midst of walking it. And in those moments, every time he had a setback, here's what we know because we can see it. They were just setups for the future. And this is character building. This is strengthening his spiritual maturity, and perhaps that's what God is doing in your life right now. You might even say it this way, the trouble and the pain you go through today is just training for tomorrow. So here's the second thing I want to make application on today, that not only has God planned and have God have a plan and a purpose for your life, but God is preparing you for those plans and purpose. None of us were expecting to happen what has happened in 2020 in the global pandemic. But it didn't catch God off guard. There was no emergency session of the Trinity as a result of this. So allow God to continue working. Allow him to begin to chisel. He's working on the important characteristics of your life in each of us. And just don't give up. So he's got a plan and a purpose. He's preparing you for it. And he's given you a promise. That's application number three. And the promise is this, that he's going to be with you through it all. So I want you to feed your faith, man. Don't starve it. Don't abandon church. Don't stop connecting. Plug in. Tune in. Engage yourself. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is unchanging in a rapidly changing world. So please, don't walk this journey alone, regardless of where you live whether you're in our community or you're somewhere else outside of this community, I want you to know God is with you. And we have weathered plagues and pandemics all through the history of mankind. And we've always come out of them knowing that God is with us. He's got a plan and a purpose. And it's not to harm us, it's to prosper us. So let me just give you one last piece of practical advice to help you as we start this journey. Some of you, you might need to stop watching and engaging digesting some of, the, uh, some of the conspiracy theories that are going on, whether it's on YouTube or wherever you might see it. You, w- some of you need to limit your social media intake and news intake. 
uh, because it's just driving you nuts and your family nuts, and you need to hear God is in charge, and man, he is unchanging in this ever-changing world, and he is where our hope is found, and you can put your hope in him. So our hope has never come from our circumstances. It's never come from a government. It comes from a good God who will not change and who loves you. And so right now, he is encouraging you in your spirit to endure and to stay resilient and to never give up. Matter of fact, I'm reminded, and I tell you this last story. You remember the movie from 2002 called Black Hawk Down? Man, I loved that movie. It was an amazing movie uh, about U.S. soldiers that were fighting to establish peace in Somalia. And, uh, and it was a true story. And when they're ambushed in their Humvee, and there's this vicious gunfire that took place mowing uh, many of them down. And one of the sh- soldiers in the middle of the film yells out something like this, Man, I've been shot. I can't drive. And the colonel responds to him, and I love this line, everybody's shot. Get in there and drive. Now, can I just say to you, man, let that be an encouragement to you, because right now, man, you might feel shot and wounded with what's happened in the economy or the world or your job or whatever's going on, and you're hurting. And, man, it's real, and I know it's real. But get back in and drive. Man, lead your family if you're a, a parent in the family. If you're a child, man, uh, you, need to, you need to just keep going for Jesus. And, uh, and I want to say to you, God is with you. He's got a divine plan and purpose for your life. And that's why I'm excited to study the life of this amazing leader called Joseph. So thanks for being on the journey today. And I hope you'll join in next week. Let me pray for us. Father, right now we come to you as a grateful people for the example you've given us in Joseph's life. And I pray that our study will be impactful for all of our lives. And we declare that we trust you, we know you're in control, and we are going to live our lives in such a way that our fear, is going to be, our fear is going to diminish and be starved out because we're feeding our faith. So we're asking, God, would you allow those who are hurting, those who are struggling, battling with anxiety, battling with depression, maybe even illness, uh, God, would you meet them at their point of difficulty? I pray you'd minister to their hearts more than ever. And thank you for using real-life examples like Joseph's life to minister to us. Hey, man, can I just say, all of this is in Jesus' name. And if you don't know Jesus, we invite you to come to know him. It's as simple as the ABCs. Admit you're a sinner. Believe in Jesus, who he says he is, what he has done at the cross by dying and resurrecting for you, and then confess it. Not to a local priest, but to the great high priest, Jesus Christ himself. So we want you to know, God loves you. So do we. God loves you. And if you're giving your life to Jesus or you need some more information, reach out to us. Man, I personally or somebody from our team, we'd love to engage with you. And so thanks for being a part of the Bible teaching portion of our worship experience today. And hey, would you share this message with a friend or two or some of your family or all of your friends? And one last reminder, God loves you. And dads, stay groovy. See you next week.